Um, but welcome to the, the last um, in our series on the stretch code um, published by DOER. And this one is on the commercial stretch and the opt-in. So again, this is um, one of many of our series. We started in January with a big overview of what was coming in the codes. And then in March, we had a talk about existing buildings as those are now um, being covered by the stretch code. We had a deep dive in April on Teddy. Um, actually, that was in June, but it was late, late April, early June. And then we also had a talk about PERS. Um, we did the uh, collaborative partnership with the Building and Closure Council and really did a um, deep dive into envelope and the criteria there. And today we're going to be covering the stretch code for commercial buildings. So this is an overview of what we're going to do today. We're going to give you a little bit of uh, background if you've been to these talks before. Um, this is review for you and just maybe an update on which towns have opted in to the opt-in specialized code. Uh, we'll have Chris Schaffner uh, delivering a K-12 case study about how he's um, gone through the thought process on a school project. Uh, Jacob Knowles will be delivering a case study on healthcare and lab use buildings. Jacob Bloom will be talking about Passive House and why that path was chosen uh, for a mixed use uh, project in Brookline. And Kristen Fritsch will be reviewing design process and internal tools and kind of the, the work she's been doing alongside other folks um, at Elkis Manfredi. So I've, I've introduced everyone and here are our avatars again. Um, Laura and I are have been leading these uh, with some help from Megan. So to review the compliance pathways and timeline, um, if you're in a green community, uh, the stretch code applies, and that is the majority of Massachusetts. There are uh, just a few towns that are not um, green communities but they may decide to opt into the stretch code and get the benefits of green communities. Um, so every town and city that was already a green community since the um, mid 2000s, automatically the stretch code is in effect. What's new this time around is uh, there's a higher level of stretch call, code called the opt-in specialized code that towns and cities can opt into by vote. They will be in effect depending on, you know, when they voted it in. So there's an updated website that you can go and check to see whether the place that you're working is um, has opted in and when that would take effect. So the a good way to kind of think about this is that the stretch code, um, the base code when it's updated, uh, we're hoping this fall. Um, will apply to those 51 municipalities um, that are um, not green communities. And the stretch code really will apply to almost all projects across the state. And then the, the specialized or net zero code will apply to some towns and cities that have opted into that higher level. And this is the way that the uh, DOER kind of thinks about it in terms of layers instead of buckets because um, they do really build on each other as well. So the, the IECC 2021 is the base code, will be the base code with Massachusetts amendments. And then the stretch code uses that base with additional stretch code amendments. And then they'll, um, the opt-in is a layer on top of that. So to try to disentangle uh, when to use what, um, a team of uh, folks that are sustainable design leaders like myself um, have come kind of come through, you know, come together and uh, brought their expertise together to create these decision trees. Um, this is one for new construction. And what's helpful here is that you really, um, if you start with a decision tree, approach um, and really try to understand yes or no, 
to these questions, you'll you'll get to the right part of the code to to review. And what we're going to be covering today is really just the commercial. So there are things that apply to residential, that's three stories and less, or residential use um, that apply to multifamily that we'll be going over, but majority of um, larger, taller buildings over three or four stories are going to fall under the commercial codes. The timeline for this, um, last year, the technical guidance documents were released. In January of this year, the residential stretch code was in effect, and some towns decided to vote on the opt-in specialized code. Then we have, you know, a whole bunch of towns and cities adopting the code that are either going to be in effect uh, now um, in July or in January next year, depending on um, whether they were voted in January or they voted six months later. So you'll see this kind of six month um, rolling adoption as we go forward. Uh, so this, this month, the commercial stretch code is officially in effect. And we're anticipating that the BBRS will update the base energy code, which would apply only to those 51 towns and cities um, sometime this fall. Starting next year, multifamily is going to have to meet more strict passive house level requirements. And then six months later, there's gonna be a lower HERS value for residential. The relative performance pathway is no longer valid for commercial multifamily. And for opt-in specialized code communities, passive house will be mandatory for multifamily. So now I'm passing it to Chris Schaffner of the Green Engineer to go over how he thought about a K-12 school. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here and um, thanks for giving me an opportunity to talk to you. I'm gonna share some work we've been doing on some K-12 school projects and uh, kind of we're, we're in the early stages of all of these. So this is a little bit of a generic information but shows the approach and what projects are doing. Uh, so the example school we're gonna look at is a two-story elementary school. It's about 9,000 square feet. It is gonna be an MSBA funded uh, project and it's currently still in the schematic design phase. So we're doing early analysis and the community set some goals that are very compatible with the new code. They wanna be uh, net zero ready. Ideally, they'd like to be fossil fuel free during normal operations and they wanna leverage incentives. So they're gonna be following the mass safe path one with a target EUI of 25 or less. So we look at the decision tree and we can see what the requirements will be on the code. Um, and uh, if we follow this down, we're a commercial building, we're greater than 20,000 square feet and we're not a high ventilation building. So we fall into the targeted performance. Uh, we're also specifically a listed use type there at school. So we're gonna follow the targeted performance path C407.1, uh, better known as the, the Teddy pathway. And then because it is an MSBA project, we have some additional uh, requirements. And Carl uh, from MSBA, I think is on the call. So if I got any of this wrong, let us know. Uh, but the latest uh, MSBA guidance that was just adopted last month says that all MSBA funded schools must meet the stretch code. And we get some additional funding if we can meet the opt-in specialized code. And this is true regardless of the status of code adoption in the town. Uh, so even if we're in a town that hasn't adopted stretch code or the opt-in, we still want to do that. So this particular project will pursue the opt-in specialized code because they, they want to be all electric anyway. So that's um, uh, the, the preferred pathway. They want to get that additional funding. Um, so as we think about what this project needs to do beyond just the targeted performance, it also has to meet all of these different mandatory code requirements. And we're going to talk about a bunch of these through the course of these different case studies. And I've picked uh, four of these particular items that we'll talk about here that our projects have used, but I also wanna highlight the air leakage testing is a really important uh, component here and is gonna be a major uh, difference from what we were doing uh, in the past on, uh, on projects. And so uh, the first thing we, we need to look at is our envelope. And before we even start the uh, envelope backstop or Teddy calculations, we actually have to make sure we're calculating our, our values correctly. So we need to look at the different assemblies and account for thermal bridges to get adjusted R values and U values for all of these. And of course, 
Uh, there are a wide variety of ways to do this. The code outlines three different approaches, uh, including pre-calculated values from our reference, which is our preferred option. I think we're finding that that works very well for a lot of situations. We've got something uh, more complex. We have modeling that can be done, and then we're falling back on the formulas in the mass code. It's kind of a last resort because we see those as, as pretty conservative in terms of the R values. Uh, and then so once we've done that, we do the envelope backstop. And so the envelope backstop is, is different in this version of the stretch code uh, because it is the whole formula we had before with the A plus B plus C is all gone. We're just looking at the vertical surfaces and there's two different pathways. This particular project has a low window wall ratio and very limited areas of curtain wall are contemplated. So we're qualifying as a low glazed wall system building which means that we have a maximum allowable U value of 0.1285 average. And what we find is to meet the Teddy requirements, we actually have to be uh, much better than that. Uh, and so uh, our takeaway from this is that if you're gonna meet the Teddy, you're gonna meet the backstop without any particular problem for a project like this. Another thing we're gonna think about is the um, requirement for uh, uh, solar ready, I believe is on the next slide. And uh, so this, again, is not a new uh, requirement in the code, but it's got a, a couple of new uh, pieces to it. And really, this, this applies very much to the typical school, because most of the projects we're looking at are, 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 are one, two, or three-story buildings with a large roof expanse. So they are really well-suited for solar already. Uh, so we want to make sure we're meeting the solar ready requirements. And a lot of schools look at doing solar, and ours uh, will we'll do that as well. But they typically do that as a separate project from the, uh, the building project because of the, the way that the NSBA and public funding works. Uh, so it's handy that we can be solar ready rather than having to put the solar on the project uh, for permitting uh, on that. And then the other uh, you know, interesting part of, of the, the new stretch code is the way we address the additional efficiency credits. You might remember that from uh, the last version of the code where we had three different items we had to pick from a list of 10 uh, for the C406 additional efficiency measures. And talking to architects and engineers, this always seemed to be something that, that slipped through the cracks and people weren't uh, really clear on what they were doing uh, there. And we, we often had to come back and, and, and do that. Um, so uh, in the new version with the mass amendments, uh, we have uh, points instead of just doing three items. And so for our project, this is actually going to be pretty easy because we need to get 15 points. And because we're going to do renewable space heating, because we're going to do heat pumps to be all electric, we'll get all 15 points. So just by being all electric with heat pumps, that'll meet our additional efficiency uh, credits on that. So now we come to the Teddy. And Teddy is actually targeted performance. Teddy is the thermal energy demand intensity. Uh, we've done, this group has done full sessions on Teddy, so you've probably got a lot of the details, but a couple of key things. It's the same units as EUI, typically KBTU per square foot per year, but it's, it's really very different. In an EUI, we look at the energy inputs to the building before it goes through a boiler or a heat pump or an air conditioning system or whatever. And the Teddy in this case is the, the demand. It's actually thinking of it as the heating or cooling that is delivered to the space. Uh, and it's, so it's regardless of the mechanical system, regardless of the efficiency of the system, it's really how much heating do you need over the course of a winter? How much cooling do you need over the course of the summer? And projects need to meet both the cooling and heating teddies. I think we focus a lot on the heating, but the cooling teddies are there too. Um, and the big idea behind this is that we wanna try to make our buildings all electric and fossil fuel free. That's the goal we're working to, towards in Massachusetts. And to do that in a way that we can actually make it work and the grid can handle, we've got to limit peak loads. That's the real key. You can't electrify without reducing peak loads. So the Teddy is a mechanism for ensuring uh, we are going to be, uh, be able to, to meet that. So uh, with Teddy, we do some modeling uh, on the next slide. Uh, and uh, the modeling is uh, kind of like what we've done in the past, uh, but it's different. And one of the big differences is there's no baseline. We're not comparing to an alternative. We're not trying to be 20% better than this or 10% better than that. Uh, it's an absolute target that we're going for. We have specific Teddy values that are calculated. The last, last slide showed that chart, and I think it comes up again in some other slides. 
It's slightly based on the square footage of the building, but it's within a range. And then in the modeling process, we have technical guidance from DOER, which uh, has been out in draft version and some final guidelines are coming very soon, we're told, that tell us exactly how to do the modeling. So a lot of what we think of is the levers for improving our building's energy efficiency are covered elsewhere in the code and the descriptive requirements and are fixed. What's uh, fixed includes things like the building operating schedule, uh, the, uh, the, the occupancy, the plug loads, lighting, the mechanical systems are fixed, right? And also the weather data we use is a fixed specific weather file. So the levers that we can use to improve our TEDI are really limited to building envelope, insulating values, the glass solar heat gain coefficient, infiltration and the infiltration rate you set turns out to be a very important lever. And then the other piece on the mechanical system, the energy recovery effectiveness, we can improve uh, based on that. And what we're finding is there's definitely a learning curve for doing this. We've get, gotten some good back and forth at DOER to help us figure out how to do this. And there's some tricks. And so we're starting to see that, yes, a good performing building envelope, if we do it right, it can meet the requirements. Uh, and, and so we can talk a little bit about what we've actually seen on the projects on the next slide. Um, and so one of the things we're finding is I think we went into this thinking, well, if we just have a prescriptive envelope, we'd meet the Teddy. But in fact, we're finding that we need to be much higher than the prescriptive requirements. We're roughly equivalent to passive house. Uh, so for our particular building, we're a 90,000 square foot building. We calculate the Teddy targets based on square foot. And so we have a heating Teddy of 2.3 and a cooling Teddy of 17.5. And I'll just also note, you know, what it changes is from the last stretch code because a 90,000 square foot building, even in a stretch code community would not have had to meet stretch code because it, it didn't, didn't trigger the requirement for modeling under the old code. So, so many more projects are covered by this code now, which I think is great. So our particular project uh, to meet the Teddy, we're triple glazing with some good glaze glass. We've got uh, continuous insulation with a nice low U value. The roof turns out to be very important on a uh, two-story building because there's so much area of the roof uh, and the infiltration rate. And so, uh, you know, the, the code uh, requirement for testing is 0.35 CFM per square foot at 75 pascals. We actually dropped it down to 0.1 to be able to meet the Teddy. And so we, from that calculated a Teddy of about 2.1 on the heating side and cooling of 16.8. So we're just meeting uh, that we pass, uh, but I do say we're very concerned about those low infiltration rates we've modeled. So we're gonna have to now be able to, to, when we get a building permit, show that we've met that number that we modeled in order to show we're meeting the Teddy. Uh, but we think we've got a pathway for doing that. So then the final step is kind of the easiest thing and that's meeting the opt-in uh, specialized requirements because we're an all electric building. We've decided already that we're gonna do heat pumps. Uh, we've decided already we can do heat pumps for domestic hot water. And the, the cooking is the one piece that's, that's maybe a bigger struggle for a school, but decided to do that. So that means voila, we've, we've made it. We've passed the opt-in code as well. Uh, there definitely been some concerns raised. And one of the big questions people have is, well, what about generators? Uh, as we understand it, the code says we can still use uh, fossil fuels for a backup generator. And then because we have the whole heating system on electric, do we have to put the whole heating system on the generator? Are there some ways to reduce the generator size? And of course we get some pushback uh, and sometimes from the engineers we work with that the air source heat pumps uh, might not work well in cold weather. We think they, they do, but uh, we can also look at ground source heat pumps and between the incentives that are available from Mass Save as well as looking at uh, federal incentives, the ground source heat pumps are really cost competitive these days. So that's what we're finding. There is a pathway in schools. We've got to pay attention and, and do all of our work. I think we're going to really have to push our, uh, our builders to make sure we can meet these uh, air leakage requirements and pass the testing, uh, but I think we can do it. Thanks, Chris. Um, I mentioned this in the chat, but if any of you are questions are bubbling up, please put them in the chat and we'll we'll run through them at the end. We'll have about half an hour for questions. Uh, now we'll hear from Jacob Knowles from BR Plus A. He'll run through a couple of case studies on laboratory and hospital use types. I am really glad that Chris went first because he covered a lot. So that's good. So now we're going to try to focus on some of the things that are different and unique for labs and healthcare. So we'll start off with the labs. Go to the next slide. 
Um, so let's assume that we're looking at a large lab. It's new construction. It's well over 20,000 square feet. Do I have control if I click forward or no? Sorry, there was a delay. Oh, OK, got it. Um, so this type of building, uh, just to refer back to the decision tree, is going to be following all the way down the right hand side of the page um, to the large commercial buildings with high ventilation rates because it's going to have more than 0.5 CFM per square foot of makeup air coming from outdoors. And similar to the table that Chris showed earlier, these are some of the mandatory requirements that apply to this type of building and some notes on the right-hand side that give you a little more detail in terms of how you might comply. So for example, on the envelope backstop, for lab buildings, because they're gonna be over that 0.5 CFM per square foot, you don't have to worry about which backstop to comply with. There's two versions, right? There's the 0.1285, that's the more strict one. And then there's the 0.16, that's the less strict one. You can always use the 0.16 for labs because, and we'll get to this in a minute, um, labs require partial electrification no matter what because they have that high ventilation rate. Um, on the second row, rooftop is gonna be solar ready. Asterisk, this is just the stretch code level. If you're in the specialized opt-in, we'll get to that in a minute. You are gonna need more solar and it has to actually be installed, not just ready. Uh, but if you're in stretch code, um, town, you can be uh, just ready with 40% of the roof. Air leakage testing, which Chris also mentioned, uh, the, the base level is the 0.35 CFM per square foot. That's the highest allowable per the code. Uh, you have to account for thermal bridging, obviously, in your envelope backstop. Uh, the building mechanical system has to include energy recovery that's at least 50% sensible effectiveness. And warning here, you have to account for if you've got an imbalance between exhaust and supply, because let's say you want to put a little positive pressure into the building to keep all the spaces a little bit positive relative to outdoors, that loss of some of that air has to be included in your calculation of your heat recovery effectiveness. So it makes it a little bit harder than, than we might have been used to in the past. Um, and then you need those additional efficiency measures that Chris was talking about. You have to hit that 15 points. And in this case, uh, you can get 11 points for having a tighter envelope for air infiltration. So that's a good one to pursue or consider. And then lighting power density is another one we often include that gets seven points. So those are two of the, the juiciest additional efficiency packages that we often use to get to the 15 for labs. Uh, and then EV parking ready, 20% uh, because it's group B occupancy. And then Chris was talking a lot about Teddy, right? That, that challenging energy modeling metric of thermal demand. Well, guess what? Labs, their thermal demand is out of control, right? So it's really hard to regulate Teddy for labs. So they go into a different category. They get to go into the relative performance pathway, which is is basically like what we used to be used to with the stretch code. You're comparing to an ASHRAE Penix G baseline. So to explain what that means a little bit, um, it's quite different than it used to be. Uh, it used to be 20% and then more recently only 10% better than the baseline. And the baseline was based on the current version of ASHRAE. Um, but now, now that we're going to the new world, the new world of ASHRAE 90.1 2019, that refers essentially back to a very old, worse performing baseline. So in a sense, the baseline that's being defined in ASH right now is going to have a lot of energy consumption, which sounds like it would make it easy to pass, but you have to do dramatically better than that baseline. And so this graphic here shows uh, a couple of key things. One is at the bottom, that gray portion of the total energy, that's the unregulated loads. Typically, that's basically plug loads, things that are not limited by the code. So you can plug in as many computers and as much lab equipment as you need for your program, and that 
matches both baseline and proposed in that bottom gray section. Then in your baseline, you're going to have this kind of old, bad performing baseline with a lot of fossil fuel consumption and a lot of electricity consumption. Those are your regulated energy demands. And then you apply a building performance factor. <clears throat> and that for labs falls in the other category, which is a 0.51 BPF. And essentially what that means is you have to get to a 49% reduction of those regulated energy demands relative to that baseline. And so on the right, you can see what you would then project as your maximum allowed total EUI for your proposed design in your energy model. So you have to stay below that, that limit. Now, the ways we do that <clears throat> uh, are shown here in this graphic on the right. So some of the things in gray here are not necessarily mandatory in the code. But there are things that we're doing in order to meet the code requirements or the overall energy performance. So things like heat recovery chillers, high efficiency boilers, yes, fossil fuels allowed in labs. Um, we're using uh, fan cool units and chilled beams to get away from all air VAV systems. We're meeting the envelope requirements which are for glazing um, and EV ready. But up at the top in the bright blue there, um, we're having to add at least 25% heat pump capacity. And it can be air source, ground source, or exhaust source to get to that 25% of your winter design heating capacity. Um, and then on the right, we're having to do at least that 50% effective heat recovery system. Those are the, the two most strict drivers for the design on, on labs. And as I mentioned, you can still use fossil fuels. So that's that's the stretch code. On the next slide, you can see, well, what happens if you're in the municipal opt-in? And you'll note that we're not going to show the scenario of the fossil fuel-free demonstration because that exempts labs. So the municipal opt-in is the highest threshold for labs. And in red, we've marked the, the changes that go into effect if you're in the opt-in. So you have to have more efficient HVAC and domestic hot water, because you're going to follow the, um, the mixed fuel pathway. Um, you're going to have to actually install the solar power, which requires at least 1.5 watts per square foot times the three largest floors. And you have to make the building so it's all electric ready. So even though you only have to put in 25% heat pump capacity, you have to put in all of the electric infrastructure and space and structural support to plan for future fully electric design. Uh, and that's actually one question we'd love to have Paul weigh in on at the end of this presentation, which is, can you even use steam beyond that 25% minimum heat pump capacity if the steam plant doesn't meet the more efficient HVAC requirements? Does, this, does, this, does the opt-in essentially preclude most steam plants because they're not efficient enough? to meet the heating efficiency required of the mixed fuel pathway. So that's a fun detail. We need to make sure we know what the answer is on. All right, so that's labs. And so we want to also show a hospital, which is similar and yet different. One of the key differences for a hospital is that it is not typically above the 0.5 CFM per square foot ventilation rate. But let's take a similar scenario as we can get. It's a large new construction project for a hospital. And it's, it's basically going to follow that same path on the decision tree, except right at that bottom, it ticks one spot to the left, because in this case, it's more like, a, say, 0.3 CFM per square foot of outdoor air, which is below the 0.5 threshold. So similar to the table before, you'll see a couple key differences. The envelope backstop here, because we're below the 0.5 CFM per square foot, you can avoid in the stretch code triggering electrification if you stay below the 0.1285 overall birth facade U value. Uh, so that we typically recommend targeting that as a starting point for these types of projects. Um, rooftop solar ready is similar, air leakage is similar, thermal bridging is similar. Ah, another key difference, energy recovery. Over 70% total enthalpy recovery is required. Um, so that's new. A lot of hospitals in the past didn't include energy recovery at all. So that's something we've, we've been doing for a while, but um, now all projects will have to do it. Um, the additional efficiency measures, often we're starting with the um, 
using a heat recovery chiller to generate hot water because you get 14 points for that if you do it right. So you're just one point away from getting a 15 and then you got a bunch of options to get to that last point. Um, it's a, often an I occupancy group. So you, you have a lower EV ready uh, charging of only 10%, uh, but you're still in that relative performance pathway of ASHRAE 90.1 energy model. The only difference here between the labs and the healthcare is the building performance factor for healthcare is a little bit higher, so 0.59 for hospitals. So you only have to get to a 41% reduction relative to the regulated baseline loads or energy. And so here again is a simplified diagram. Um, a lot of the same things of meeting the envelope, putting in a heat recovery chiller, uh, but the top there in blue are the key highlights though. Um, you need that 70% effective total energy recovery. So typically it's gonna be an enthalpy wheel. And then it may require in terms of achieving the overall energy performance for the relative performance pathway is you may need some heat pumps, even if it's not prescriptively required. So typically what's interesting is the labs, if you follow all the prescriptive requirements in the lab, it's probably gonna pass the energy model without any extra effort. Whereas hospital, even if you check all the prescriptive requirements, because electrification isn't one of them necessarily, uh, you may fall short of the energy model requirement and have to add heat pumps to get overall energy performance up to where you need it to be. So that's the stretch code version. And then if you go to specialized, similar changes here to the lab to be all electric ready, which is, you know, that's a significant investment for, for hospitals. Um, you have to, again, install the solar, uh, which can be challenging given limited roof area. In some cases, we're looking at wrapping some solar panels down the vertical facade of the penthouse to get enough capacity installed. Um, and again, this question about can you use district steam for, for your, uh, you know, supplementing any electrified loads that you have, or is that not going to meet the more efficient HVAC requirement of the mixed fuel pathway? So that is our hospital case study. Sorry, my Zoom window was like, went somewhere. Let me, oh, I went to the end of the presentation. Let me unshare. And I will share again. Um, and we're gonna hear from Jacob Bloom about um, a passive house case study, which is interesting because uh, this one gets more into the the design aspects of using the code rather than the so much of the technical side. Really, just how the code helps um, when you know in the from the lens of a designer and architect like. How, how do you navigate um, what what to tell your clients and and how and how to um, hedge bets when you know projects were in design before the final version of the code was released? Take yeah, it away, so, Jacob. yeah, so uh, as Allison pointed out, I'm going to be a little less technical because I'm not going to go through all the requirements of what it takes to meet passive house because there are plenty of other resources out there to go over that. Um, but I'm gonna talk about why we decided to follow the passive house pathway for these projects. Um, so if you wanna to go to the next slide, I can talk about what the program is. So this is for a mixed use project uh, in Brookline. So it's a 200,000 square foot multifamily that's greater than six stories, um, which will come into play regarding timeline. Uh, for the opt-in code and a 150,000 square foot hotel. They are two separate buildings, but it's one site that they share and it's going to be permitted as a single project. So we're, we're considering it as one single project, even though the programs are somewhat separated. Um, it's also in Brookline, which has adopted the specialized opt-in code effective uh, earlier this week. Um, and they've passed a warrant article for the new fossil fuel free demonstration uh, program from DOER. Uh, so if you want to go to the next slide. So 
because this is a mixed use project, even though it's being permitted as a single, single project from a permitting standpoint, the energy code basically says that we treat each portion of the program separately. So we've got one part that's the multifamily, which is gonna follow the residential pathway. Then we've got one part that's the hotel, which is gonna follow the commercial pathway. And because the multifamily is mid-rise, it falls under the commercial energy code still. Um, and similar to what Jacob Knowles was talking about, the, the hotel falls into that uh, low ventilation uh, commercial pathway. Um, so first I'll go through the, the uh, decision tree for the multifamily portion of the project. Um, so the we are in a stretch code community and we have adopted the specialized opt-in code. Um, so that drives a lot of our decisions right there. So if you go to the next slide, we can sort of follow that decision matrix down. So we're greater than 12,000 square feet, which keeps us in the, the commercial code and we're over, over five stories. The over five stories is really just an effect on timeline. So if we were under five stories, we would have to be meeting passive house now um, as of this past week. Um, if you look at sort of the legend in that bottom corner, you can see the green lines uh, are pathways that are available for us until January of 2024. So uh, about six months from now. Um, if we were had a building permit in hand before then, we would be able to follow either the Teddy pathway or the HERS pathway for the multifamily portion of this project. Um, after that, we would have to follow the passive house pathway. Um, we, we decided that we were gonna start following this passive house pathway uh, a while ago before we knew exactly what the energy code was gonna be because we didn't know exactly what was coming. And with all that uncertainty, we, we knew that passive house was gonna be the, the most straightforward pathway forward for us at this point we're probably not going to have a building permit in hand by the end of the year. So passive house will be our only pathway forward after that regardless. Um, and, but, but we were already looking at that as a pathway prior to knowing that just because of the uncertainty with some of the upcoming requirements. And I'll talk about more of that when I talk about the hotel portion. Um, in addition, uh, you don't have to read all this text, but that's, uh, from the warrant article that Brookline passed to, to opt into the new fossil fuel free um, new construction demonstration project. Um, and basically it says that uh, all new construction will need to be fossil fuel free uh, with some exceptions. Uh, we could use uh, fossil fuel for the heating of domestic hot water, but with everything else going all electric on this project and the other systems that we're, we're using, it really made sense to just follow that all electric pathway, which also means that the specialized opt-in code has no additional requirements for us other than being all electric. If we were following the mixed fuel pathway like Jacob Knowles uh, had referenced for the healthcare project, then we would need to meet those new requirements for installed solar on the rooftop and uh, pre-wiring for future electrification. But because we're following the all electric pathway now, we avoid all that. Um, another big factor in following this pathway early on were the mass save incentives. So we already utilized that $5,000 feasibility study incentive to run a feasibility study um, back before the final code language was released, knowing that this was probably gonna be our best chance to, to meet the new code as it, uh, as it comes forward. Um, there are also significant other incentives coming from the Mass Save program for the residential portion as we move forward with certifying Passive House, that $500 per unit pre-certification and the $2,500 per unit certification bonus. Um, so you can go to the next one. So that was sort of the residential portion. For the hotel, we did have a few more options and we still decided to follow the Passive House pathway. And I'll go through sort of how we got there um, through this decision matrix. So again, we're in the stretch code community. Um, we are not one of those uh, uh, use types that requires the Teddy pathway. Um, the Teddy pathway is still an option for the project, but we don't have to follow it. Um, similarly, passive house is an option for any project type 
but it's only required for um, the residential portion under uh, the opt-in code. So because we are not uh, one of those types, we, we could follow those other two pathways, um, but we decided to follow the optional passive house pathway again, uh, largely because of the uncertainty and some of the reporting requirements that are um, required when you follow those other pathways. And I'll get to that in a minute. And Kristen will talk more about uh, some of those reporting requirements as well uh, for those other pathways. So we decided to follow the passive house pathway. And then in the next slide, again, um, we're following the all electric pathway because of that uh, fossil fuel free ordinance and because it made the most sense to not have to install additional pre-wiring for future electrification and to not have to install solar at the time of construction. We still will probably uh, install solar and some of that solar may help us meet the passive house requirements, um, but the all electric pathway on its own doesn't require those as mandatory. And so the other big driver for the hotel following Passive House was also the, the mass save incentives that you can see the EUI targets to qualify for Path 1. And Chris uh, pointed out when he was talking that the K-12 EUI target uh, for Path 1 mass save incentive is in EUI of 25. For the hotel, it's 35 because hotels have higher energy use. That's still something in the realm of like a 60 to 70 percent improvement over over a baseline energy and the way that we felt that we could meet those numbers and get this incentive which are are really substantial um was to follow passive house so you can see that you know chris also mentioned the ground source heat pump incentives right if you're following path one it's i think forty five hundred dollars per ton um to uh, incentivize you to use ground source heat pumps, or there's also incentives for air source heat pumps and VRF. And there's also that uh, EUI target financial incentive as well. So all those numbers are helping to go towards offsetting some of the upfront costs that might be associated with going passive house for a project that uh, wouldn't typically need to. Um, there is still some uncertainty with the passive house pathway, in addition to all the other pathways as we figure this out. FIAS, the organization that, uh, the US based organization that certifies passive house, um, hasn't certified a hotel before. So we're working with them directly to figure out what the passive house requirements are from an energy standpoint for a hotel project, because they're, they're going to be different than they are for, uh, for multifamily residential. And if you go to the next slide, so the other the other big component in this decision was a lot of these new requirements, right? The envelope backstop, which we've had before, but is changing a lot, um, especially one because the numbers are uh, so much lower than they were in previous versions of the stretch code in terms of the U values we need to hit, and the thermal bridging derating, which Kristen's going to talk about more, is a huge impact on meeting those U values. And so by following the passive house pathway, we don't need to do the envelope backstop in the, the way that the code prescribes. That's not to say that we don't have to account for thermal bridging and we don't need to account for air leakage testing. Those are both part of the passive house process also, but it's through the passive house Woofy energy model and it's through the passive house certification project or process. So we don't need to document that separately and submit it along with our construction documents for a permit to show that we've met these backstop and thermal bridging um, derating requirements the same way that we would if we were following the other pathways that have been described, the Teddy pathway or the relative performance pathway. So that's that's really the how we got there. And then I'll, I'll hand it back to uh, Allison and Kristen to talk about the internal tools that they're using uh, on these new new processes. Thanks, Jacob. I think I figured out the Zoom issue for anyone else. Spacebar used to be able to hit to unmute. Now it takes you in Google Slides to the end. I don't know. Good to know. <laughs> Learn something new. You know, every day it's a new Zoom day. Um, so we're going to um, now pass it to Kristen Frisch of Elkis Manfredi, and she's going to talk to us um, and kind of 
you know, goes for, you know, show kind of uh, the dirty laundry or whatever you want to call it of, you know, what all of us are kind of going through right now. Um, this, the stretch code is really revolutionizing um, how we practice and um, all, all towards the, are all towards the good, um, but it is, it is a big change. So um, Kristen's been generous enough to kind of share with us some of that process on the next slides here. Good morning, everyone. So I'm sustainability coordinator at Elvis Smith Friendly Architects. So, which means I know a little about a lot of things. So I'm going to do my best here. But um, through my role in the office, I've been working on updating our teams on the energy code um, changes, assisting with creating new tools, and collaborating with our QAQC group, which is about 30 or 40 people, um, to work through all the ways that these updates are affecting our design process and documentation. So I'm sort of a support person. I'm here representing the team and talking about what this means for our designers. So this is by no means all encompassing. We're still trying to unravel all the implications and test this out on projects, but I'm walking through some of the things we've been working on relative to our typical large scale glazed commercial buildings. Um, so I'm gonna sp expand on all of these, these four bullets, but you know, first we're gonna to need to determine um, on our project, you know, the path we're gonna take. And then we are still responsible for the backstop calculation, but really needing, what's new is needing to understand those inputs, um, which is really we're finding as requiring early engagement of an enclosure consultant or manufacturers or subcontractors. Um, and then, you know, also again, early review of key details to understand thermal bridging and air leakage is really important. So next slide. Um, so as Jacob was mentioning, we have the we have the two paths. Um, you know, one of the first questions our design teams are going to need to answer is which one is which one are we pursuing? And as far as we understand, with the, the you know, Teddy is going to be pretty challenging. We're taking the approach that we might as well do a passive house feasibility study is, is that may make a lot of sense for, depending on the project. Um, so we're this, and this of course is for office, you know, your, your commercial buildings that aren't multifamily. Um, but this feasibility study would be involve a woofy model versus a Teddy energy model. And so we'd need to involve, um, you know, an energy modeling consultant. This could be a sustainability consultant that has the capabilities. And then we're also looking at internally if um, our own passive certified passive house consultants could also do this WOFI feasibility study. Next slide. So just as we're responsible for the backstop calculator in previous editions of the code, we're still responsible for the compliance in the 10th edition, which I mean architects. Um, it's been simplified, but only in that it includes the vertical wall components. So we don't have to worry about adding in the roof and, and slab or below grade walls. But what's more challenging now is for all of those um, vertical wall components, we need to quantify the thermal bridges and show the map for derating them. So this is something new to most designers. While we were generally using rules of thumb in the previous backstop calculator um, for our U factors that accounted for thermal bridging, um, now we have to show our math and, and really need to understand where we're getting those numbers. Are they from the curtain wall manufacturer? Are they from modeling? What, you know, where are these coming from? Um, and then we need to be able to identify all the thermal bridges and do a thorough accounting of those. Um, and then derate them. So really quick on the um, next slide, um, th these are the three types of thermal bridges. Um, the clear clear field, which is like, you know, an area of cladding with a regular pattern of attachments. And then the linear thermal bridges, which are elements like pat um, parapets, slab edges, and then the point um, connections like canopy or beam penetrations. So identifying all of those on, on throughout the, um, the project. So next slide. Once, so once we tally up the instances and lengths of the different types of thermal bridges, there's three options, which Chris kind of touched on earlier, that we can use for determining the derated U factor for the different components. 
So, so in our calculator, we're going to have, you know, for example, a, a wall type, um, say opaque masonry, and we're going to have a certain square footage of that wall type. And then underneath that, we're going to have a list of all the ways that it's going to need, basically the list that you see there in the prescriptive, um, you know, the balcony to exterior edge, intermediate floor, that list of, of items where we're going to account for that wall type having um, a certain length of any of those type of bridging elements. And then it'll, you know, there's formula that we'll use. But what we're trying to figure out is um, what values to, to derate by. So these three different, the prescriptive option is one option. Um, and, you know, we've done a limited, a little bit of testing on this, but we feel the values are really conservative and likely are projects wouldn't pass. Um, so we started digging into the BC Hydro Morrison Hirschfeld um, document, the building um, guide. And that, you know, has a bunch of details that you can pull information from that, which has been really helpful. So that's the referenced um, pre-solved site values. And then the other option is to do two or three dimensional and they call it finite element analysis to calculate the psi values. So um, you would use, you know, we can use 2D for an example, like you see there in the image, um, and then 3D modeling would be needed for point thermal bridges or when thermal bridging happens in multiple directions. So what we've, we tested, you know, gone through a lot of these, and, and I say we, it's our, it's our bigger team. Um, but our current approach is that we're collecting and creating a library of details um, from the BC Hydro Guide and, and using those values, um, referencing those values. And then, you know, if we've done modeling or testing on other projects, pulling in the, those values, and then we're also starting to use Therm um, to, to do our own um, evaluations. And then what we're, we're really trying to do is build this calculator that references those um, the values. So, so everybody in the office knows where they came from. Because one of the big, big things with the ninth edition was we had everyone had the backstop calculator, but it was one of those things that could get passed from project to project. And the values, you know, where'd you get your value for the glass, or where'd you get this value? And, and it, you know, it, it kind of got away from us. Um, and this time we really want to make sure that these, you know, everyone understands what's going into it and making it a really user-friendly document. Um, so, so at the same time, we've been working on all these details. We've also been taking every opportunity to educate everyone in the office. So our cons consultants have been sharing fantastic lunch and learns. Um, and then occasionally we've had internal brown bag lunches where we've watched the recordings of this coat series, for example. Um, and we're also taking advantage of BE plus um, workforce training grant. So they have a class on energy codes, which has been really helpful. And then um, the passive house training in, in various forms. There's a couple um, overview classes. And then of course, the, the training for CPHCs, um, which we've supported a handful of people receiving that training. Um, so we also have a high performance analyst on our sustainability team. And he's been working with the building envelope team in honing our therm capabilities. And then he's also looking into Woofy, just started doing that. And, and we think that um, being able to be fluent in these will help us have a more internal iterative process, um, which I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing that develop. And then next we looked at um, what we need to do to update our design documentation. So using the building envelope thermal bridging guide, our building envelope team has been upgrading our typical details. And specifically details, if you go back to the last slide, the spandrel and para, um, parapet have been really specific details that we've been working on um, where we're looking, we're looking, yeah, this one, um, we're looking at how, you know, how, why, why this or how this might conform to the 10th edition. Of course, we're still just testing this out, but adding that extra um, insulation and detailing and addressing thermal bridging. So next slide. So in the previous edition of the code, we'd already made it a standard in our um, office to have a thermal envelope compliance sheet in the drawing set. 
So this outlined the conditions around the building. It also included the backstop calculations. So we'll be continuing that practice and, um, and adding, you know, updating that. But then also the other approach we've taken is um, we see a couple of details on the sheet that this is essentially our approach to moving towards a more performance-based spec for facade systems. So we're showing the design intent that meets the code, but then leaves the flexibility for the contractor to use their systems of choice. And then it's their responsibility to achieve the U factors that we've, we've set out. Next slide. So, so far, this is what we think we need to do. To do. Um, so early, early on, identifying these critical details, as you can see, it's gonna be important working throughout the project and working more closely with the curtain wall suppliers to achieve um, the design intent. Um, you know, passive house curtain wall is a unicorn, so maybe we'll get there, but um, but working with the suppliers to improve performance is key. And I think I think we underestimate underestimate our power to shift the marketplace in that sense. And then lastly, there are a few other things we need to include in our documentation: more explicit demonstration of the continuous air barrier, and then identifying where testing will be performed or included in a field inspection plan. So I think I think we're all appreciative of the goal of the code updates, but I think it's maybe been underestimated that it also drives us to have a more integrative design process with the entire project team from early design through construction, which I believe is really going to result in better overall projects. Um, and in that spirit, I will end by stating that this is a work in progress, and I'm curious to how others are doing it or what we're missing. Thank you, Kristen, for sharing all that. I'm sure uh, you know, if we collectively came forward with all the different tools we're working on, similar to de the decision tree, um, we'd have a lot of great approaches to, to tackling this. Um, we're now going to launch into, um, I have a slide of resources. And again, if anyone wants a copy of these slides, I'm happy to email them out. I put my email in the chat. Um, and it also has our presenter contacts if you wanted to follow up with any more information. Um, and we'll now open to questions. Um, there were a few, but I think most of them were uh, in the chat. So feel free to unmute if you have a question and um, could, could I'll I, direct it to the right person. Could I address the question that Carl Brown put in about air source heat pumps? Sure. Versus ground source heat pumps. Yeah. So Carl's question was basically the viability of air source heat pumps as opposed to ground source heat pumps, um, and so that's a you know it's a tricky question, and, and Jacob or others could certainly weigh in. Um, what we see happening on a lot of projects is uh, that people are looking at design conditions that maybe aren't aren't reality. Um, so I'll, I'll, I guess the caveat first is that if you really do a good building envelope, it makes it a lot easier to do everything. Um, all of the issues about will you have enough heat in the middle of the cold weather uh, certainly are, are less of an issue if it's a well insulated building. Um, ASHRAE design conditions are like seven degrees around here and we see a lot of people designing to zero or below. And when you get to that level, your, your COPs, sorry, I'm turning into an ASHRAE meeting maybe here, but your COPs get very low on your air source heat pumps. And then we see people putting huge numbers of condensing units, for example, and so I think you just need to assess what are the actual design conditions that you're really gonna see. You know, every 60 years we get minus 10 for an hour and that doesn't necessarily mean we need to design our buildings for that. What we were seeing is an approach before the new code was that people were doing hybrid systems where they might have some other backup for that really cold conditions. My sense is if, if a building is doing opt-in in a, in a gas ban community, they're not gonna have that option really to do that. Um, and then they should really look at geothermal, but, but air source heat pumps are totally viable at the temperatures that we typically see here for the building types we're talking about. To, to add to that, um, the most challenged type of air source heat pump is an air source heat pump that's trying to generate hot water. A lot of air source heat pumps send refrigerant or an integrated refrigerant and water system for distribution. But if you just have a piece of equipment that's trying to pull heat out of the cold air and generate hot water, which often is at 120 degrees or higher for the building, 
as it gets really cold outside, those heat pumps tend to trail off in their capacity and ability to heat. So luckily our understanding of the way the code is written is the heat pumps need to achieve at least the ashtray 99.6% condition, which in Boston is about 8.7 degrees Fahrenheit, which even those heat pumps can absolutely achieve. Uh, below that temperature, if you have to be fully electric, we believe the code allows electric resistance, which of course is not great, but if it's necessary for your project, you can use that solution to make sure that you have a fully electric, fully resilient system and generators can help support those electrified systems for emergency operation or grid power outage or things like that. So there are pathways to a resilient solution, not, you know, not simple, um, but, but doable. Thank you. I'm going to run through some of the questions in the chat. Um, there is a question from Christopher Armstrong. Does DOER have a date when the new technical guidance document discussed in previous coach sessions will be available? And I know we have some folks from DOER on the call. I'm hoping they can answer that or uh, reply to that need. Hi, uh, can everyone hear me? This is Paul from the DOER. We can hear you, thank you. We can hear you. Yeah, sorry, it took me a moment to unmute. Um, so the every all the speakers did an amazing job. I just wanted to say that it was very accurately presented. Um, so really appreciate the AIA putting this together and helping get the word out um, on all this stuff. So thank you so much for your hard work. Um, on the guidelines, um, I wish they were published already. So I'm, we're apologizing for not having them already done by 1 July. That was always the, the intent. Um, it took us a lot of revisions based on a lot of great feedback by lots of people. So we kept going back and revising things to try to get this right. So we do have the Teddy chapter and the ASHRAE chapter that are going to be published in about a week or two. And then the, the overall larger guideline will be published in the next month or so to answer that question. Thank you. Can I ask Paul a follow-up question? Uh, specifically to Jacob's point about can I, in, in, under the opt-in code, designed for ASHRAE 99.6 and then use electric resistance for the rest. Is that, is that legal? Yes, it is. Yeah, so Jacob described it uh, accurately. Excellent, okay, good to know, thanks. All right, I also wanna point out that, you know, this is uh, the presenters here today and myself and Laura, we're, we're not code officials. We aren't code consultants. So I would advise everyone to, that's on this call to go in and read the code if you have any questions. The code is actually very, pretty clear. And then once the technical guidance, um, if you start applying it and you're coming into an, an issue or question, the idea is that the technical guidance document should try to answer some of those questions. Um, so, you know, for, for example, there are a couple questions in the chat um, one from does the building performance factor vary by per building or square foot? And uh, Chris pointed out in the code, it does list building performance factors based on building area types um, in the code. So there is a section for that, as well as the electrification requirements. Um, if you if you go in and read the code um, and, and then follow up by looking in the user's guide, it, it really does tell you exactly what you need. And if there's um, additional questions or something doesn't quite make sense for your project, you can reach out to DOER um, for those more technical questions, or you could um, you know, facilitate a conversation with your AHJ and DOER if, if something is, is really unique. Um, so as, as we're learning all this, my understanding is that um, DOER will update technical guidance so that all building officials kind of understand what the baselines are. Um, 
And our, our hope today was that we've given you kind of an overview or a way, a leg in, so it's not as scary, it's not as uh, um, daunting to, to really dig into the code. Let's see. I, um, I, yeah. I have a question for Jacob, if I could ask another question. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is with the, the Teddy requirements being close to passive house, a lot of project types are contemplating passive house, including a lot of project types that haven't really been thought of as passive house in the past. And you you talked about your experience with hotel. And I'm wondering if you have any insert, insight more generally with how the passive house folks are dealing with people coming to them with other building types. And are they able to provide guidance? Are they still developing the requirements? Uh, if you could provide a little more insight on that, that'd be helpful. So I, we, I will say I work in an architecture firm. I'm not a passive house consultant. So we hired a passive house consultant for that project, um, which was also helpful in understanding how to meet the code because with all of these new things, having a consultant that already understands the requirements of passive house and has been through it and has a good working relationship with FIAS or PHI um, has been helpful. I know that they have been going back and forth and basically trying to establish what those requirements are. And there has been there has been some back and forth there regarding the hotel. And I would imagine it would be the same for other project types that uh, FIAS hasn't certified before. Um, but uh, I don't have, I haven't had the conversations myself, but I believe they're, I believe they're working with individual projects to set out what those requirements are and how the uh, existing passive house standards that mostly apply to multifamily would get extrapolated to other project types. May I add a little bit more to that thread? Uh, this is Paul from the DOER. Um, also consider reaching out to PHI. So the code allows both BS and PHI certification for passive house. And PHI does have uh, a long history of applying passive house to all building types, including hotels. And there's actually already several in the US that they've been, several US hotels that have been PHI certified passive house. Yeah, PHI did just certify the new Hotel Marcel in Connecticut, which is a little different than our situation also because it's a, it was a retrofit project. Um, yeah, thank you. So there, there were some questions in the chat about getting links to resources. I think those were mostly answered. Those links will also be in the presentation if you want to request a PDF. Um, we do have a, a kind of a different question from Bernadette uh, for interior fit outs with a change of use occupancy or higher power demand. Will the building envelope be required to be updated if not already included in the project scope? So I do have a slide on the existing building pathway that I can bring up and we can talk through. Um, maybe Paul, you, you'd be the best person to answer that one. Yeah, um, the, the answer is yes. <laughs> so um, this, yeah, let's, let's use this slide as a uh, jumping off point. So, um, alter rate. So you have to you have to see where your building fit your retrofit fits into different categories. So the categories are change of use, um, or alterations, um, or repairs, and there's also additions. Um, so you have to see which one of those categories you'd apply to. Uh, so in change of use uh, is very important one because. Um, there's a lot of buildings that were built for a certain purpose and under the old, well, the, the ASHRAE rules, which we no longer allow anymore, um, you used to be able to trade off build your envelope with no limit. So for example, there's a lot of buildings that might be office buildings where the envelope performance was traded off in exchange for improved lighting or better fans or uh, higher levels of ventilation energy recovery. And if that building's turned into a residential building, then the performance of those things that the envelope was traded off against then vanish. 
Um, so the, that's the reason for the change of use. It's kind of like a reset button to say if your building is going to change its use, then you have to kind of start from ground from from uh, the starting point again. So yes, you'd have to upgrade your envelope to meet um, the current standards in that case. If you're not changing the use, um, then your building is an alteration. And the alteration rules say uh, you have to update whatever you're touching. So you don't have to chase things out for the purposes of energy code. So if you're doing an interior fit out change uh, and you're going from office to office and you're not changing the the exterior envelope, then there's then there's no update to the exterior envelope needed. I can elaborate further, but I'll, I'll I guess I think I'll stop there. See if there's any additional questions on that. Paul, one of the questions that often then comes up is to clarify that is to say, is it use group? like a B use group or a R use group or an I use group changing to a different one? Or is it be, is it more subtle than that in terms of being like this, the use of the space? For example, <clears throat> office and lab are both often a B use group. But if you go from an office to a lab, our understanding is that it does trigger a change of use because you're increasing energy consumption. Is that correct? Yeah, it's the subtle one. So the IECC uh, guidelines, the one, not the ones we wrote, but the IECC words um, clarify this point. It says that you don't have to have a change of group use. You don't have to have a change of subgroup use. The, the, the trigger really is changing the energy use. And how, how small scale of an actual amount of space can cause that kind of a trigger? For example, whole building, Yes, makes sense. Whole floor, I believe also yes. What if it's like one small piece of a floor that's office use and it switches to, they wanna build a little lab space in that part of the building on just that part of a floor. How, how small does it get that it's still gonna trigger the same set of requirements? Just a little wee lab space, no one will notice. Or maybe um, it's a, a data closet. Yeah. I think, and well, the data class is a good example. So I, I, that that to me doesn't seem to pass the the threshold for for this kind of drastic response. So so if there was some sort of um, um, very discrete item like that, I think that that that's something that is uh, where the authority having jurisdiction needs to weigh in. And what if you had a whole office floor that was a total gut renovation? And then after the renovation, half of it is lab and half of it is office. And it's all kind of mixed together because you got write up space and a conference room and more lab and this other thing over here. Is that essentially going to be one project that is effectively now a lab use, even though parts of it are office? In that case, I would say so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we can, I like that we can use our kind of rational mind to like, say, okay, yeah, that passes the sanity test, meet with the AHJ, get their sign off and and hopefully proceed. Yeah. So, thanks, Paul. I'd like to, uh, you know, so just some more perspective on this change of use. This has been coming up a lot and I think, you know, in, in a good way, um, the, the IECC rules that have been written, we'd actually didn't change those. Those are just the way IECC has read. Um, in the past, there have been options to use ASHRAE and things which are no longer there. So, so the change is not that we changed IECC, but that that we that we uh, that more buildings now have to do this than there used to be. Um, so, um, we do think that it is a rather brute force thing. You know, it is a rather brute force thing. It's the the chapter five of the code is is kind of a brute force afterthought. It's it's not it's not fully fleshed out in a way that it should be. So we we'd like to actually engage with the design community sometime in the future to to work out what should a renovation uh rules of the road look like. So that way we don't have to do drastic things where they're not necessary. Um so so we're we're 100 percent on board trying to go in that direction. We'd like the design community to help us out with that sometime in the near future. I, I threw a bunch of questions into the chat, but I just want to 
uh, reiterate what I think I heard Paul and Jacob say earlier that reaching out to the AHJ is super helpful. I know we're working on a reno project in Cambridge and uh, we sat with the uh, Cambridge building officials and talked through some of these issues. And uh, you know, to the extent that you can get the, the local authority to, to discuss the project with you, it was super helpful to understand what they would be looking for, especially in terms of things like the air testing and such. Um, you know, if you're doing partial renovations, figuring out scope and how that would work exactly. I do also want to point out that um, up on the BSA website is a whole, you know, hour and a half talk on existing buildings that really does a deep dive into that topic. Um, and it, it it does get a little complicated. So we we especially you know commercial versus residential and all all of the nuances there. Um, so I would recommend everyone kind of walk, go go through and watch that one as well if you if you have more questions. Um, and I also wanted to point out the specialized opt-in uh, doesn't apply to uh, renovations or existing buildings. Um, it's really just for new construction. So that clarifies uh, that question. Um, but and, but the, the new, the, the pilot gas ban, we'll call it, does yes. include that. So it, it, you're not off the hook yet. Right. And if you're just doing a window replacement and you're not upgrading the wall, you probably don't have to do the air leakage testing, but you might want to do a water test anyway to make sure <laughs> uh, there's best practice and then there's what's required in the code. Um, are there any other uh, questions from the audience? I think we've kind of tackled a lot that's in the chat. Good that everybody has such a clear understanding of all these complicated issues. I was going to say the um, BC Hydro Guide was mentioned by Ian is a good resource and it, it and it is a great resource and I understand that they're updating it. Um, I'm not sure constantly, but um, but maybe uh, more often than you think. So keep checking or downloading the latest version. Mm -hmm. And uh, the link to this video will be posted by the BSA. It's usually taken them about a week and a half to get it up. But if you want the PDF in the meantime, just email me and I'll get it to you with updated links. Um, we can certainly end a little bit earlier uh, than 1030 if, if we don't have any other questions. Um, are there any final uh, comments from, oh, we got, what about renovations in historic buildings? Uh, does someone from DOAR wanna respond to that? I think we've we've addressed that in previous talks, but we can we can say the same thing again here for the record. I can. Hi all, this is Ian. I, I can take the historic building question if you want, Paul. Um, sure. So essentially, um, the IUCC for 2021 updated the historic building language, and and we left it unamended. So um, if I can find it, I can copy and paste that into the the chat. But essentially, you should go to the IUCC 2021 commercial chapter historic buildings language, and and what it says is that if it's a listed building or if a uh, suitably uh, qualified expert can show that it's a historic building and that um, energy improvements would damage the historic fabric. So that, that's the new addition um, in the IUCC. Then you're exempt from the energy requirements altogether. So that, that's a key decision early in a project to assess um, what applies if if it's a historic building and you can improve it without damaging the historic fabric, which typically means the external facade, then then you're all set. Thank you. Oh, it's another another research searchable database. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I'll I'll be updating the 
the slide, the resource slide at the end with some of these links um, before we leave. Um, final comments from the presenters? In May I, that we spoke, if you like. May I just add a little more clarification to that? This is Paul. Please. On the historic building. So if you're if you're if you're the registered historic building, it, 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 the process doesn't exempt you from the code altogether. Like it's not the first part of the process. Um, you know, I'm historic, so therefore the code doesn't apply to me. It doesn't work that way. The code applies broadly, and if a particular provision within the code um, would would um, would harm historic fabric. And you can demonstrate that following that provision would would do harm, then then you're exempted from that particular provision. So it, it doesn't give you a an, an, uh, a get out of jail free card for the whole code. It just gets you a a relaxation from particular provisions within the energy code. Jacob Bloom, this might be a good question for you to answer from Studio G. If you do the passive house track in you know, commercial commercial residential, do you still need to fill out the envelope backstop calculator? My understanding from the technical guidance draft that's out now is no, that that backstop is required for the Teddy and relative performance pathways, but not required and for the prescriptive pathway but not required if you're doing a certification pathway like Passive House or HERS. That's correct. There's another um, question about 2D and 3D therm modeling can give very different results, especially for spandrel and similar assemblies. Who makes the determination as to what is acceptable documentation for code compliance? I can answer that one if you'd like. Sure, thank you, Paul. Um, so the they will give you very different results, especially if you're um, in the case of spandrels. Um, so we we have recommended in our guidelines that spandrels always have three D modeling because spandrels inherently are just full of uh, thermal bridges that are intersecting in different dimensions on a 3D three-dimensional level. And a, a 2D model of a of a uh, spandrel is just not gonna cut it. Um, so there are applications where a 2D model might be helpful. And that would be looking at, you know, if you wanted to understand a point connection in a um if you if you had a, a clear field situation and you wanted to understand how a particular connection might affect the overall performance. You could do a, um, a a 2D cut where there isn't the connection, and then a 2D cut where there is a connection, and then do some sort of you know weighted averaging and such. That would be an appropriate use of 2D modeling. Um, but for a spandrel, it's it's just not possible to use combinations of 2D models to get the correct answer. Thank you. There was a, another question regarding the definition of an all electric building. Um, Sam Maloney has an instance where uh, fossil fuel gas is used for educational purposes. Um, is that inherently a mixed fuel building or, or is it possible to define this building as all electric? Um, I would say, you know, um, gas in, in the building that isn't used for heating, yeah. cooling, or domestic hot water. I, I think those are the major systems that the energy code regulates, but um, and, and cooking can, and cooking. That's correct. If it's not one of those uses, the energy code doesn't regulate it. Yep. Yeah. We actually looked at this with the Studio G folks on the Ben Franklin Cummins Institute of Technology. They have an all electric building, but they're training people in repairing and replacing gas equipment. So they have gas connections for that. And we spoke with Paul and uh, confirmed that that was still going to be an all electric building. And Andrew Wang um, asked if we could revisit the question about district steam and lab use and is uh, a district steam system 
uh, acceptable to handle some of those peak load situations. Yeah, I think the the question I was asking about earlier was, yes, it's allowed because if you if you meet the twenty five percent heat pumps, sure, use whatever you want beyond that. But what what about the opt in mixed fuel pathway additional HVAC efficiency requirement? How does that impact central plants? And if the steam plant is not very efficient, does it not comply with that? And therefore, you can't connect to it unless it's just for backup or beyond, you know, beyond the 99.6% kind of a condition. Yeah, that's a good question, Jacob. That one, I'd have to go take a look at that section. Yeah, good question. Okay. Another update to the technical guidance. <laughs> yeah. And if I could um, just a little bit further in the definition of all electric building, I think there's a subtlety in the code that I've discovered that I'm not sure everyone's seeing that there's a difference between electrification in the stretch code and electrification in the opt in code. So in the stretch code, it's really just heating. Uh, when they talk about fully electric or 25% electric, depending on the pathways, that's, that's just the heating, and the opt in code includes those other sources, um, other uses like domestic hot water. Um, so it's important to keep that consideration in mind. Yeah, there is, uh, in the regular stretch, there is a scenario where the electrification applies to both the heating, space heating and hot water heating. In the case of a uh, 50%, uh, larger than 50% glazed wall system building, it needs to be fully electric space heating and water heating. Okay. And then otherwise, otherwise, what you're saying, though, is true that the uh, when you go to the specialized, there's there's more scope of electrification to include cooking, um, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Thank you to our presenters for your time today, and um, we look forward to you know maybe doing a recap of any of these sessions as after the base code comes out, and we kind of see how how that scenario works. Um, it's our understanding that DOAR is working to update ComCheck as well as a, um, once the uh, base code comes out, there'll be a, a code version where it's all combined rather than uh, re referring all, all over the place. Um, so that should should help us all as well as we are, as we're you know flipping back and forth between sections to figure this out. Um, we look forward to seeing you sometime in the future after the base code comes out. But thank you for attending today and um, have, a, have a great Friday. <laughs>